for joining in us today. Um, we had a break from Media Lab last week, so it's, it feels like it's been a while since I've seen many of you. Um, most of you know I'm Nikki, I'm the Director of Education at Montana PBS, and we've been hosting these workshops. This is our second year of hosting Media Lab workshops, um, and we're here to, to show you a couple of tools, show you how you can use them, give you lots of time to play around so that by the time we're done today, you feel really comfortable taking them into the classroom to use with kids. I'm joined by Tracy today. Uh, Tracy, will you just take a moment to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Tracy Pilts. I uh, work for Billings Public Schools, um, taught kindergarten for, um, gosh, about 12 years. And now I've been working as the K-3 tech integration specialist. So um, I get to just go into classrooms all around um, our district and help kids and teachers use um, technology in their classrooms. And I'm super excited um, about this one. Nikki introduced me to um, PBS Kids Scratch Junior probably a couple of years ago now. Um, and I was a reluctant learner. <laughs> Anything that seems a little hard, I'm like, eh. <laughs> um, but once I really dug into this one and started doing it with kids, it's really quickly become um, probably my favorite tool to um, go into classrooms and, and share with kids and teachers. So I'm super excited about this session today and, and hope that you guys are excited as well. Um, this week we're going to talk about Peg plus Cat, and you'll see a little bit why once Tracy gets into the PBS Kids Scratch Junior app, but Peg plus Cat is one of our PBS Kids programs. Um, the emphasis is on math and problem solving, and it's for kids ages three through eight. When I first started working for Montana PBS, I got to go to a conference where the creators of this program were presenting, and they did a fun presentation and kind of talked to us about some behind the scenes information about Peg plus Cat. And here's what I learned. One 20 minute episode takes nine months to create. And that is because they start from scratch and they start with the learning goal first. So they say, we're gonna make this episode about teaching kids about improper fractions. And then they're going to build from there. And once they create the episode, it's all original music and um, the storyline because it combines both music, art and math in this, in this series. They put it in front of several different focus groups made up of curriculum specialists and even kids. And by the time it's passed all of those tests, then it's ready for air. So that's how you know that these are high quality productions. Um, we have a collection on PBS Learning Media that goes along with PBS, what goes along with Peg Plus Cat, but then there's also full episodes and clips on the Peg Plus Cat YouTube channel. And both of them are linked right here. Um, you can, their episodes are focused on number sense, geometry, and measurement. There's online games and activities, and then there is a connection to the PBS Kids Scratch Junior. I'm going to show you the collection and have you look at one of the short clips just to get a, view, a feel for what this show is all about. What I love about Peg Plus Cat, and I did use this um, with my kids when I was teaching, you go to video clips over here. I used this for 100th day, 100 days of school. We did this um, chickens activity and we watched this chickens video. So it's cool, a couple of things to notice while I'm showing the video. First of all, notice that the background of all these scenes is graph paper. That's on purpose. <laughs> That's the math connection. You're also going to see math symbols and equations sort of in the background of all of the scenes. That's also just meant to build in, um, math connections and to see if kids can notice those things. This clip is only a couple of minutes. The other cool thing about this is no, um, problem solving is both um, perseverance, but also some of the emotions that comes with problem solving for kids. So look for um, how Peg and Kat talk about solving a problem. And I loved this because Peg would always say, I've got a really big problem. And they would have to breathe to get through the freak out of the initial problem solving process. And then she would breathe and get her way through the problem. Um, and sometimes they'd sing a song or have some kind of a strategy that they'd practice. And then when they get done, they sing the problem solved song, which 
which my kiddos loved. And we would use that in math in all of our lessons, problem solved, problem solved, and use it to celebrate our success. So watch for all of those while you watch this clip about Peg and Cat counting their chickens. All right, so that is the resource. It has the video that we just watched. And then over here, the support materials, there is an educator's guide with the numbers and counting. And then there's an activity that goes along with Count Your Chickens, which is this really nice printable that I used to print out and either use for subplans because it was so easy and turnkey, or I had a paraprofessional that worked with my kids and took them and did activities outside of our room sometimes. And I would include these for her to take and uh, show the video together and then do the activity. And they were pretty easy to implement. So the Peg Plus Cat collection um, looks, it has a lot of those types of activities. Try to find my back button here. Um, you can go into your video clips and look for things by numbers and counting, geometry, measurement, and spatial sense. Um, you can also find online games. And these games work across most devices. If you have tablets, you'll find them in the PBS Kids Games app. Um, or you can use them just on your Chromebooks or on your um, desktop computers. I liked using these games on my interactive whiteboard and I would play it with a couple of rounds with the whole group and then bring it to small group and make it one of our station rotations and the kids could play the game at the big whiteboard and I could kind of always watch from wherever I was and see what they were doing on that big interactive whiteboard. The camp um, is meant for after school program settings or out of school settings, um, but one of we've found that the activities are also a lot of fun for single day lessons as well. Um, it's really like a formal lesson plan all spelled out for you, um, how to view the video, salt, take kids through the problems process, uh, and then do a little activity that goes along with um, those camp activities. So you could maybe take this camp curriculum and make it you know, a week's worth of lessons in your classroom as well. So that is our PBS Kids Program Spotlight. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and toss it over to Tracy to do our um, coding apps. Go ahead, Tracy. All right, thanks, Nikki. Um, and I'm warning you all now, I thought it would be a really great idea to try to run this whole thing off my iPad um, since I wanna show you an app. So um, please be patient with me as I kind of um, play around. So welcome, super happy you're here to learn about this. Um, I always love um, doing these with Nikki because I always um, learn something new too. I'm constantly amazed by um, the resources that are provided in that PBS learning media. There's just so much there. Um, that's what we just need one session where we just sit and like dig into all those resources, Nikki. It's amazing. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, kind of fly through so we get back to, there we go, awesome, um, to the right um, slide here. So um, again, <clears throat> chatting about um, coding, but really more, I think, about storytelling. Um, I really, really have gotten to love um, these apps, like I mentioned before, um, because I really love how it combines kind of the best of both worlds. Um, since Montana adopted um, some computer science standards, I really have been trying to look into um, some great ways to start infusing those um, standards into our classroom um, with computer science and coding in a way um, that doesn't feel intimidating because I do think sometimes when we hear coding and computer science, um, we think it's gonna be um, um, difficult for us to be able to do that, especially with our young learners. Um, so I was really pleased when Nikki showed me this um, a couple of years ago, her and her um, friend Carrie from Idaho um, PBS. And it's really become um, something that I enjoy taking into classrooms and doing with students. Um, I remember I was doing it with first and second grade and I said to Nikki, do you think kindergarten could do this? And she said, oh yeah. Um, so I started doing this in some kindergarten classrooms um, and I would you know, finish this lesson and the next time I went back to that classroom, the teachers would say, can we do more? Um, that was our absolute favorite. And these were um, you know, reluctant 
student um, technology users. And this was by far their, the favorite thing that we did um, in their classrooms with their students. So um, we're gonna take a peek into kind of both of these apps a little bit, but mostly spend our time in PBS Kids Scratch Junior. Um, as Nikki said in the email, just kind of a heads up if you haven't already, um, they are apps. So um, it isn't something you'll be able to just do from a browser. So if you haven't already, and you have the ability to do so, um, I would recommend just taking a moment or two to um, download one or the other of these. There's PBS Kids Scratch Junior, and then there's the regular Scratch Junior app. So um, kind of as we're chatting here, if you haven't already, um, just take a couple of minutes to try to get those downloaded on your device. Um, there is an app in the Google Play Store, so it can be downloaded onto Chromebooks um, if your Chromebook is able to access the Google Play Store. Um, and then you can also put it onto your iPad or Android. Um, I did a, a workshop a couple of weeks ago and we discovered I think Android phone users could get it onto their phones, but iPhone users could not get it onto their um, iPhones. It had to be on an iPad. So just kind of a heads up um, that in order to explore, you are going to need that app. So um, what we're going to kind of do today then is just talk a little bit about why teach kids to code. Um, we'll dig into Scratch Junior and PBS Kids Scratch Junior. I'll share some classroom examples and do a demo, and then you'll have some exploration time and time for questions. And then of course, um, prizes. And when I looked at the prize screen, I thought, oh, there's some good ones here, Nikki, you did good. Um, so first of all, why teach coding? Um, there is a link here on this Jamboard, and I actually left it um, from the last time because I, I there were some great responses on there. So when you go to the Jamboard, it's not um, going to be completely empty. I'm going to go ahead and um, tap on here so we can look at this Jamboard really quick. You click on that link. Let's see if this is going to look for it. Um, if you click the link, there's just a little space here where you can um, kind of share what you think is important about teaching coding. If it's new to you or if you're not sure yet, that's okay. I'm going to look at a, a video here in just a moment. If you're not familiar with Jamboard, um, these are all just sticky notes. So over on the left-hand part of the screen, that little square with the lines is a sticky note. So if you just tap on it, oops. I didn't wait patiently enough. Um, tap on it and then, and you can change the color of the sticky note as well if you'd like, and then just tap in there and you can type your note and then it will add it to this screen so that we can all kind of um, see those, um, those thoughts there. So if you have something that is on your mind right now, you can add it. If you wanna wait until after watching this video, you can wait as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this quick video. I think it's a nice little introduction um, to sort of answer that question, what is coding? Coding is the new literacy. When we think about reading and writing, we think about words on a written page, but coding is the language that computers speak in. The way we define coding is creating a series oh, of instructions. I was trying to make that thing go away. Coding is the new literacy. When we think about reading and writing, we think about words on a written page, but coding is the language that computers speak in. The way we define coding is creating a series of instructions that tells a computer or another piece of technology what to do. Gosh, when we think about computer coding, we think about people sitting somewhere in a dark room in front of a great big monitor and they know this secret language that no one else knows except them. But what I've learned with PBS Kids Scratch Junior is that everyone can code. It's a language that we can all learn and that we can all speak. It's not a bunch of zeros and ones. It's not even a really an unfamiliar language. There's a lot of easy ways that you can implement it in the classroom. When you use PBS Kids Scratch Junior app on your mobile device, each of those blocks do a different thing. You're putting them together in a sequence and you're creating anything that you want to create. 
Educators do not need to be proficient in coding to teach kids to use this app. Teachers are able to very quickly understand how to use it as a learning tool in their classroom. And really and truly, if the teacher gives the kid the go ahead, the students are going to be able to teach the teacher. I'm sure all of us have had an experience where we know that that's true, right? Um, where if we just kind of let the students go, they'll usually end up teaching us something. Um, I think when I really first started to fall in love with this app was um, I was in a second grade classroom and I said, I just want to spend, um, you know, can I come once a week for like a month so I can really spend some time showing your kids? And the teacher said, of course, yes. And so um, we did our first lesson and then I went back and did the next lesson. And between those two lessons, lessons, I was just blown away by what the students had sort of figured out on their own and started to create on their own. Um, so that creativity piece, um, particularly I think with this app, because of that uh, drawing element, we'll look at that in just a moment, um, I think is um, really just phenomenal. And so I was, I think it sparked some um, excitement in me too, because I saw so much potential for what they could be doing um, because just on their own, they sort of started making and creating all of these things. And so that's when I was like, gosh, this is so much more than just teaching kids to code. There's so much more um, in here. So um, again, kind of back to that question, why teach coding? And hopefully you'll put some ideas on that jam board. Um, you're also welcome to just go ahead and unmute at any time. Um, the way I'm presenting, I can't see your faces. And so if you do have a question or something um, that you wanna contribute, please just unmute um, and don't feel bad about interrupting me and just go ahead and share. Um, but these are the things that I think are really important. Um, I think it can be a really, really um, unique and creative and engaging way to allow our students to show what they know. Um, once they have learned about um, recycling, here's an example we did this spring, we learned about caring for the earth and recycling. Um, students could have, you know, just written down or said, you know, here's how to care for the earth. Here's something you can do. Um, instead, we incorporated this coding piece into it. So then they were demonstrating what they know by creating this whole coding project showing how to care for the earth. Maybe it was cleaning the ocean or it was recycling. They could really show that creativity. Um, they could show that problem solving. They could show their computer science skills while also demonstrating that knowledge of what we had been learning. Um, storytelling. I'm always telling them that, you know, you're telling a story. We're not just putting random characters um, onto a background. We're not just, you know, kind of creating this um, chaos because when you look at this app, you'll see the first thing that they're gonna do is just start putting things on here. Um, and that's fine at first, I think, just to kind of explore. But I really do try to continue to say, we're telling a story. What's the story that you wanna tell? How are you gonna make it make sense? How are we gonna give it that beginning, middle and end? Um, retelling stories. I saw a really cool example um, on Twitter of a kindergarten teacher whose students um, retold the very hungry caterpillar using um, PBS Kids or Scratch Junior, um, putting all of those characters and things in there and then retelling that story. Um, of course, we know coding is great for that perseverance and that problem solving to have to um, kind of give something a go, see how it goes. Um, and if it's not quite right, figure out where those mis mistakes are and then um, try again. And then I also really love this for collaboration. Um, whether you have them actually working together in pairs or small groups, um, or if it's just kind of an informal, you know, be sure to have conversations and ask questions if you get stuck um, so that they're talking and having um, that communication with one another. I think this is such a great collaborative exercise for them. Um, did anyone else have anything else that they wanted to add? Anything um, you know, in that why teach coding anything that really stuck out to them. Um, one other thing I kind of wanted to highlight, because I think that's the biggest question I get and something I really liked in that video. Um, 
But a lot of people will say, well, how do you explain it? How do you talk to kids about it? How do you explain coding? Um, I am certainly not um, a computer scientist or an expert, so I keep it pretty simple. Um, but exactly what was discussed in that video, um, I really explain it as directions. Um, when I go into a classroom the first time when we're talking about coding and computer science, we talk about um, how does a computer or a game or an iPad know what to do? Somebody had to give it directions to show it what to do. And so we just really talk about it in that manner of the code that we're giving it, our directions or the steps that we want it to take. Um, so I think that video does a nice job of just really simplifying that. And that really does make sense for kids. Um, and as we look at some of these resources, you'll see um, that both Scratch Junior and PBS Scratch Junior have a lot of wonderful supports. Um, for teachers um, who are feeling maybe a little bit um, unconfident or um, reluctant in doing this. There's so many great supports to help um, kind of talk through those lessons. So the first thing we're going to just look at briefly is Scratch Junior. Um, I actually had, um, I always love when I see him come up on that video, um, Aaron Morris. Um, I was able to meet him at an AC convention where I was with um, a PBS kids a couple of years ago. Um, and he was talking about um, PBS Kids Scratch Junior at that convention. And he basically said um, he loved Scratch Junior so much, they sort of reached out to the creators of Scratch Junior and were like, hey, could we make a PBS Kids version of this app? Um, so really, it it functions the same exact way where the differences are, um, are in the backgrounds and the characters that the students have access to. And so we'll kind of dig into that um, when we look at the PBS Kids app. But I also wanted to be sure to show you Scratch Junior um, itself because it works. If kids learn how to use one or the other, um, they could easily use both. All of these are um, links. So if I tap on any of those buttons, okay. Yes, please take me to that um, website. Um, it's going to take you to the um, Scratch Junior page and see if it takes a minute. I'll hop back and I'll let you do that. Okay. Um, so here's the Scratch Junior page. Um, and again, you'll see um, activities and resources across um, those tabs here. Something that I really like um, are these just sort of activity pages. Um, if you're not sure how to get started, um, there's, if I say read more, it'll really give me like this whole idea here for how can I make, how I make my car drive across the city. Um, and so it's almost like a simple little task card that kind of helps students. Um, what I found, <laughs> I had, uh, here's an example. I was in a second grade classroom around Easter and I was trying to get them to code something like Easter. -y. My example was I was kind of had made a little Easter bunny and I was showing them how to sort of code that basket. And of course, well, do we have to do an Easter bunny? Could we make it this? Could we make it that? So finally I said, okay, go ahead and code like here's my example go ahead and code whatever you want well of course two minutes after they sat down most of them are like mm, they couldn't think of an idea i don't know what to do what should i code and i was just chuckling to myself because i was like well you guys that's why i told you to start with the easter bunny so um, my point in telling that story is sometimes it's so exciting and they get so overwhelmed. There's so many choices there, but they do have a hard time focusing. Um, so I think that these activities can be a really helpful start. Um, for getting them just kind of playing and exploring with a purpose. Um, if I just hand them the app and just kind of say, okay, go for it. Um, they will usually figure some things out, but it is, um, like I mentioned, kind of chaotic. Like it's not telling a story. There's not um, an intent or a purpose. Um, and so I really like trying to kind of focus that right from the beginning. Um, and so again, that they see that this is a tool, a way that they can share their learning, a way that they can tell stories um, and not just kind of a playing around um, sort of thing to do. So I do like having these um, sort of um, activities with 
step-by-step um, -by -step instructions and, I, and really help them to kind of focus and get those ideas. Um, there's other resources on this page too. Um, again, like a little video showing the interface. If you want to know what sort of the blocks um, mean, there's printable images um, and pages here. And then on that learn tab, um, I think this is a really helpful guide as well. This was helpful to me as I was um, beginning to learn this app and still learning. I don't know everything there is to know, but sometimes if I'm like, oh, I, I'm not sure what that button does, or I can't remember what it does, um, this is a really helpful tool to be able to just kind of look at all the descriptions and know what everything is going to do. So um, just kind of a nice resource page for Scratch Junior um, itself and where you can find a little bit more information about um, this app. I'm going to show just a couple of examples that were created in Scratch Junior. Maybe. It's thinking about it. Oh, shoot. Hold on. Let's see if this one does it too. Okay, good. That one played. Um, this one might it might be worth maybe trying um, from your, if you have the slides, you can look at that one and see if that one plays for you. Just a couple of examples. These were from first grade um, of what students can create. And really, um, I'm gonna try to play that again and pause it for a minute. Um, what I really love about this, um, that Santa right there, and again, this is a first grader, um, the Santa is drawn, the fireplace is drawn, um, that little Christmas tree and the presents that she put in there, those are all details that she added herself. So um, we'll look at the app here in just a moment and you'll see that there's a lot embedded in it, but I love how that drawing tool really gives them that creativity um, and the ability to add anything that they'd like into those um, scenes. Okay, now, there we go. Um, so like I mentioned, P the PBS Kids Scratch Junior is, it functions the same, but when you look at stickers and backgrounds, um, those are going to be um, PBS Kids characters and shows. Um, I really love this because most kids are super familiar with PBS Kids and really love um, the characters in the shows. And so they make that connection right away and get super excited um, about using this app. Um, a lot of them will say they watch it after school or, oh, when we have like inside recess at lunch, we get to watch Wild Kratts and things like that. So they get super excited um, when they see the PBS Kids I usually wear like my PBS kids shirt um, and then I, I show them this app and they get really excited because again um, they have a really positive connection um, with PBS kids and the programs that they watch on there. Um, they also have a wonderful website so I'm just going to tap on the scaffolded lessons and resources um, link here at the top um, and I think my, um, I usually start with this one because I really do like the in-depth um, activity and lesson plans offered here um, with the PBS Kids Scratch Junior version. So when you sort of um, scroll down under activities, I'm going to tap on the tree problem here. Um, and again, this connects to Peg plus Cat, um, which Nikki had been highlighting for us earlier. Um, and you'll see, I'm just going to kind of slowly scroll through this page so you can kind of see how in-depth these activities really are. So again, it is like a full lesson plan um, for you as a teacher to begin introducing this. You have your learning goals. I like how it sort of has these keywords. And if I tap on these, it'll give me those um, definitions for what that vocabulary is. Um, any materials that I might want. Um, usually they um, include some kind of design handout. So if you want your students to first on paper kind of be thinking and sketching um, and sort of storyboarding and designing, um, you can um, provide those handouts to them. 
And usually it starts with a little meeting. I do like that there's some kind of play and explore. Um, I usually use this introduction, the Simon Says introduction, anytime that I um, am teaching coding with students, um, because it really does bring home that idea again of coding is um, providing a set of instructions of what we want it to do. And so we play that Simon Says game um, and I'm, after we're done, I say, well, you were just like little robots, right? Um, I gave you directions. And then when I said, Simon says, that was like your trigger um, to do what I asked you to do. And so that really is a nice kinesthetic way of kind of bringing that whole idea home. There is some um, time here to just kind of play and explore the app a little bit so that they can make those discoveries on their own. Um, shows you sort of the main blocks or buttons that we're gonna be using for this lesson so you can kind of highlight. And then it always has um, a little um, clip from a PBS Kids show. So this one um, with Pig Plus Cat has this um, get another tree problem episode. And it, again, it's probably about 10 or 11 minutes. Um, so students watch this little video clip and then it introduces a problem. Um, so in this particular clip, the problem is that Pig gets stuck up in that tree. And when Cat tries to help her, he also gets stuck up in the tree. Um, and so it introduces this problem. And then um, the students get to go back to this PBS Kids Scratch Junior app and use the stickers and the backgrounds within the app to basically um, recreate that whole scene and then design how they would solve that problem. So um, I love how just kind of um, connected and engaging um, this um, activity is. Students get so excited when they realize their um, screen looks exactly the same as you know the video up here because they have all of those same um, you know the same tree the same background the same pig the same cat so they get really excited that they can recreate that um, and then of course some kind of um, extensions are in here and then there's always like a parent handout um, which I usually screenshot and then um, send home on seesaw so that parents know that they've engaged in this coding throughout the day. The other thing that's awesome about both of these apps is that they're free. Um, and so it's also another really great thing to suggest to families. I've had lots of kids say to me, I went home and my mom put, you know, PBS Kids Scratch Junior, Scratch Junior on our tablet at home. Um, and so I love that it's accessible to them and it's free for them. And it's something that they're excited um, about using at home and going home and asking their parents to do that for them. Um, these other links on here, um, this one goes to PBS Learning Media, which Nikki had kind of highlighted at the beginning. There's lots more resources on the PBS Learning Media site um, related to a lot of the programs that you're um, going to see within the PBS Kids app. And then um, the links there for the iOS app and the Google Play app. Um, I will say too, I don't know, um, I noticed a few Billings people on here, but not all Billings. Um, it is approved for use um, in the Billings Public Schools District. Um, I don't know if other districts right now are going through um, approval processes with um, apps and websites and things. Um, it doesn't collect when we um, get on to the app here in a minute, you'll see it doesn't collect um, any kind of data. There's no sign in for students. Um, you just open it up and, and start creating. Um, so there was no need for any kind of um, data privacy agreement to be signed or anything like that. So um, we were able to get these um, approved pretty easily for use in billing. So if they're not approved in your district and you have questions about that, um, please let me know. But um, because they don't collect um, anything and because they're free districts like that too, um, we didn't have any problem um, getting either of these approved. This um, screen is just kind of highlighting that resources page again that we just looked at. And um, let's see if this, hopefully these videos will play, let's see.
Um, and this was a kindergarten example. Um, so pretty simple, but again, you'll see she's created her um, background using um, the PBS Kids characters. And then her solution was drawing a ladder. So she drew that ladder and then coded both um, Peg and Cat um, to go down that ladder. So she helped them solve their problem. I'll play that again. Um, hey, Tracy, just yeah. real quick, I had a message from Lindy, and I think it's a good one to bring up to everybody. She said, since there's no sign in, does it save the student's work? Do you want to speak to that? Oh, yeah, that is a good question. Um, so it saves on the device. Um, and I can pop. OK, let's see. <laughs> Here's her when I go from app to app. Um, it saves on the device. So this is the device I've been using going into different classrooms and doing projects. Um, so you'll notice the things that I've created are saved here on the device. So if the student is using the same device, um, it's going to be um, saved there. There's not a great, and, and we'll look at it. I'm going to do a demo here in just a second. We could do it right now. Um, there is not a great way to save these. Um, like there's not a save or a share button, which that part is a little bit of a bummer. I'll show you sort of how we work around that um, to be able to then put these onto Seesaw or wherever else you kind of save and share projects. There is a way to do that, but they don't just disappear. Um, so they do save on here. And I don't know the other, um, I have some on another iPad too, and I have even more. I don't know if there's a limit. I've never reached a limit <laughs> where they start like deleting or anything off of here. I've got quite a few saved on another iPad. Yeah, I've never reached a limit. I've deliberately gone in and deleted a bunch, um, especially when they've been connected to a certain lesson so that kids aren't sneaky and go in and <laughs> see the, the solutions to the tree problem. <laughs> Um, uh -huh. yes. I've, I've never had, I've never gotten a warning that my storage is full on that one. I haven't either. Okay, good. And you'll notice to delete, I just kind of tapped on there until I could get rid of this one. So you guys are going to, I should, I shouldn't even tell you this. So like this one on the right, <laughs> this is what a great illustrator I am. This one, I'm going to delete it right now. That one was mine. This one was like a first grader. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm keeping hers and getting rid of mine. I was like, oh, you did a much better job, <laughs> much better job. Than I. That's <laughs> what I is art skills. I'm like, yes, I want to do my branch like yours. Um, so while we're in here, I'll just go ahead and kind of start showing this to you. Um, so again, you notice I didn't have to, maybe I'll kind of go back to the very front. Like this is how it's going to open and I just say start and here I am. So again, there's no sign in or collection of any kind of student name or anything. I'm going to start a new project here. Um, it always has dot in the front. If you're on Scratch Junior, it always has that Scratch cat. So we kind of make a joke of like, oh gosh, they really want to be in our projects. I think probably one of the trickiest things for them to learn how to do is get this out of there. <laughs> Once they do that, everything else is easy peasy. Um, because what they try to do is like drag it <laughs> until it goes away. And what you need to do is just kind of gently hold down on the character until it starts to wiggle and then you can exit. And that's how they're gonna get rid of anything extra in there that they put. Um, it's funny to me that they'll know that that's how to get rid of dot or scratch, but if they accidentally add other characters, then they don't know how to get rid of them. Um, so it's the same sort of method. I'm just gonna kind of go across um, the top here. Um, the home button will just take me right back to where I just was, where all of, um, again, all of my projects that I've done on this device are gonna be saved. Um, this button here just kind of makes it big um, so that I could see my project without code at the bottom. Um, I've got a grid here and I'll show you why that's helpful here in just a second. Um, backgrounds are here and again because I'm in the PBS Kids um, Scratch Junior I've got all of these really cool PBS Kids backgrounds. So if we're working on the, um, sorry I've got to get to my check mark. <laughs> There we go. Um, if we're working, I'm in the way. Paper, yeah, 
get in the way, I gotta move you out of the way. Uh, if we're working on pig plus cat, I, I usually instruct them to please pick this background. Um, and so that they can kind of set up that tree problem. And when you have exploring time here in just a minute, um, this is what I'll encourage you to work on unless you kind of come up with your own idea. But if you can't come up with an idea, I would encourage you to do this um, pig plus cat tree problem. So um, I've got my background in there. I also, you'll notice, have um, some text. So they can add like a quick caption or something like if I, oops, let's see. Um, uh, you'll notice that I could add like a little caption. You couldn't add like a whole paragraph or anything, but sometimes I will have them write like a quick sentence or a label about what they've created. And then my characters are over on the left. Um, on the right side where Nikki is, um, you'll notice that I can add extra pages. So I try to point that out to them just because sometimes they click the wrong plus sign when they're trying to get characters. I try to say, okay, what do you think is gonna happen here? It's gonna add, oh, I just, I don't know how that happened, but look, I made you disappear. Um, so they know that if they click on the right side, it's gonna add pages they can add up to four pages. Um, I'm gonna click on the left side um, so that I can add some characters. And same as my um, same as my projects, anything that I've created, any drawings that I've created are gonna save on my device as well. So you'll notice here, I've got lots of things that I've drawn on my own um, that are saved here at the top. When you open yours, it's gonna start down here. You're going to start with these PBS Kids um, characters. And if you kind of scroll, you'll notice you've got lots of characters here. Um, when you get toward the bottom, you have some characters that you'll find in um, regular Scratch Junior. So when I hit on this part, these are all things I might find in the um, regular Scratch Junior app that I could use here as well. And then the ones here at the top are all from the um, PBS Kids. So again, for our tree project, I'm going to click on Pig, and I will put her up here in the tree, and then I need to add another character. And so then I'm going to find Cat and add him up in the tree as well. Now that I've added some characters, you'll notice that I have the coding blocks across the bottom. Um, they weren't there before because I didn't have anything to code yet. Um, it's important with this, I think, to kind of um, explain anything um, that's added as a character is something that can be moved. Anything in the background is going to just stay still. Um, so for example, that um, that Christmas, that Santa example that we looked at, she had drawn the background with the tree um, and the fireplace because she didn't need those to move. The Santa was then drawn as a character because she wanted to be able to code and move and animate the character. So anything that they want to move is going to be added as a character, even if it's a present or a ball, it's still going to be added as a as a character. And then the other thing, and that's why this I think is a great um, first sort of practice is they need to be coded separately. So you'll notice when I click on peg along the bottom, I'm gonna be coding peg. If I click on cat along the bottom, I'm gonna be coding cat. Um, and so sometimes they code one <laughs> and think they should both move. And so that's an important thing is each one of those need to be coded separately. Once we add those characters, I then have them kind of brainstorm. Okay, now what's your, um, what's your solution? How are you gonna get them? out of that tree. And this is where they get to actually be super creative and draw. So I'm going to add another character um, and I'm going to use the, the paint tool here in um, Scratch Junior to add that other character. So I'm going to click on just a blank character and then the paintbrush to get into the drawing tool. Um, and that um, page where it kind of shows you like what all the buttons do, that resource page is really useful for this because it is just a little bit different than most drawing tools that kids use. Um, first of all, like once you click off of something, um, 
it doesn't just automatically give you the drawing pen. So like right now I'm not drawing because I'm on the scissors. If I want to be drawing, I have to be on that little squiggly line over there and then I can draw. There's not an erase button. I can undo or if I tap the scissor and tap what I want to get rid of, I can cut things out. Um, but they're used to seeing an eraser button. Um, the shape tools also take a little bit of getting used to. So I'm going to click on the circle just to kind of show you. Um, these buttons here will make it thicker or thinner. Um, of course, I can change the color also along the bottom. If I want to draw a shape, oops, <laughs> um, I'm basically just going to kind of put my finger down and drag until the shape is the size that I want it to be, and then I'm going to let go. What often happens, which I did, because <laughs> um, it's hard to kind of remember, is your is a lot of kids are trying to draw a circle. So like, and then they'll lift up their finger and keep trying to draw and get a little bit frustrated. So I'm not drawing a circle. I'm not drawing a square. I'm kind of putting my finger down and just dragging until it's the size that I want it to be, and then letting go. If I want to fill it in, this paint bucket is really helpful because I can just touch and I can fill in any shapes that I want to fill in. So it makes that coloring piece a lot um, quicker and easier. The stamp will duplicate. So I can kind of um, duplicate and then this arrow right here will move those pieces. So if I want them to move, I want to be tapped on the arrow and then I can move them around. Um, I'm going to just kind of delete all of those little shapes that I put in there. Um, and I'm going to go back to my squiggle tool and I'm just going to draw a ladder for this. Um, I'm using real good creativity here. Um, the ladder is what you'll see a lot. A lot of them come up with the idea. I think it's suggested in the video and that's fine. Um, especially kindergarten. I noticed most of them just kind of go with ladder. Um, I was really, really impressed going into like first and second grade, how they started being super creative. Some of them would make a trampoline and they have them jump and bounce off the trampoline. Some of them um, used a fire truck or a helicopter um, and really came up with some creative ways to get um, pig and cat down um, out of that tree. When I'm done drawing, I'm just going to go ahead and do the check mark. Um, you'll notice I might have, should have made it a little bit longer. Something that I can't do because that's saved in there, I could just go back and get another one and just kind of stack them together so they have a little bit longer. Um, right now, if I started coding, I would be coding the ladder and I don't want the ladder to move. So I wanna be sure that I'm on one of my characters that I want to move. Um, the first thing that I always wanna do is kind of have that trigger. Like we talked about Simon Says. Um, Simon Says is that sort of start button. That's what makes you do the thing. Um, on here, I need that same kind of button. And usually what we start with is the green flag. So my start buttons are all in that yellow block. I kind of wished it started on the yellow block because that gets forgotten a lot. Um, but what I'm going to do is then drag so that it's going to start when I click on the arrow up at, or the flag up at the top. So I want to start both of them on that flag so that when I click it, they're both going to move at the same time. And right now I am coding cat. So what's the first thing that I'm probably going to want to have her do? If anyone wants to tell me, you can unmute. Okay, um, I want her to probably move toward the ladder. So I'm gonna have her move over um, to the right a little bit. And here's where that grid can be kind of helpful. When I click on it, um, you can kind of see how many spaces it's gonna be because what they'll usually say is go right. Um, but when I go right, I'm gonna click the flag. You'll notice it's not quite far enough. Um, I'm going to reset it using the little arrow right next to the flag so that she goes right back where she was. And then that grid kind of helps me. I probably want her to go one, two, three, four to get over to that ladder. So I could drag one, two, three, four of these. Um, another thing that I usually teach the students right away is that they could also just change that number. So if I'm doing four rights, I could also just change that number. So now let's try it again. And that's about right now she's on that ladder. 
Then the next thing I'm gonna want her to do is go down. Um, and again, the, this grid can be really helpful because maybe I'm gonna count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm gonna have her go down maybe nine or 10. Let's give it a try. So I'm gonna reset it and run it. And she did pretty good. Some kids might then want her to scooch over so she's not sitting right there. And then the next thing that I'm going to want to do is move to cat. So I'm going to kind of reset it, put her back up there. And now I'm going to make sure I'm coding cat. I'm going to again start with my flag. With cat, I could just have him move down. Um, I don't need him to go over to begin with because he's already where I want him to go. So I'm going to just count. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Maybe we'll have him go down like eleven. Actually, I'm going to show you. I'm going to just do nine and just try it. He's not quite there, and that's okay. So I'm going to go ahead and switch, um, change that up. So I like having kids just kind of just try it, try it and see what happens and then decide what you need to fix. So he didn't get quite to the bottom. I'm just gonna go ahead and maybe change that to 11. So reset again. And then again, I could sort of adjust them if I don't want them right by one another. Um, some of the other buttons, and this isn't part of that initial lesson. Um, so I usually keep it pretty simple on the initial lesson, but some of the other buttons for you to look at here, um, I could then have a little talking bubble here and maybe he's going to say, we did it. Whoops. <laughs> we did it when he gets to the bottom. Um, you'll notice that I could grow my characters or make them be invisible and come back. Um, there's an audio tool so I can record a pop sound or I could record um, my voice with some audio that would play. Um, there's some timing tools and a repeat tool. And then at the end, um, I could repeat something over and over. I could end it. If I've added an additional page, I could also automatically go to that next page. Um, so there's a few more things in there. I usually don't introduce those right away with students if we're following that PBS Kids lesson scaffold. Um, they've got it set up so that they introduce things a little bit at a time. So like in the next lesson with Wildcrats, they'll learn how to use the speed button and um, these buttons that make them go invisible or get bigger or smaller. So I know that those will be introduced a, a little bit at a time. Um, but just so you kind of know what all is hiding in there. Questions about that piece so far, I do want to show you kind of how we save on the iPad. Oops, sorry. Okay, so I clicked out of there. Um, when I'm ready to save, again, there's not just like a save button. It will be saved if I click here. You'll notice that it did save here on my dashboard. So I, it's not gonna go away. It's gonna be saved in Scratch Junior, um, but I wanna share this like you guys were talking about. I wanna be able to share this with my classmates or with my teacher um, or with my family. So um, we use Seesaw, you could save this and put it in other places that you share as well. But I usually teach the kids to use screen recording and you could do that on your iPad, you could do that on your Chromebook um, to get to screen recording. And I'm not sure what we're gonna, hold on one second. Um, we're not gonna be able to sort of see it right now because that's basically what I'm using to share my screen with you. Um, but when I pull down my control center, you'll see that I have that little circle button and that's the screen record button. So I teach the students to pull that button down and record. And then what we would do is just let's play our project. And once it's done, we're going to pull down from the control center and then this time we'll click on that red button to stop it. And it's gonna record a video um, that will be saved onto our camera roll. So I've just made a screen recording basically of my project that I could then save. Um, from there, what I would do is then um, I would open up 
maybe seesaw. And I could click on the plus sign and upload and find that video that I had saved um, wherever it might be. Um, here's a video and then I'm going to check mark it. And check mark it again and then i'm able to save. Um, i'm able to save that video. So there is a way to save, even though there's not like a save button, there is a way that you can um, screen record and then share these. Um, sometimes I also just teach students how to um, do a screenshot. So you can also teach them to do a screenshot. Um, the only problem with the screenshot is then um, obviously they wouldn't be able to see the actual movement or the animation. So here's just a couple other examples then and then I will start. I've been talking a really long time. I'll stop talking, I promise. Um, hopefully you're kind of playing along. Hopefully you were able to get the app and are kind of playing along. Um, here's just a couple other just sort of screenshot examples. Um, again, I think it's a nice, it shows the project, but you don't see the actual like movement and animation. Um, but I do really love how um, they can use that drawing tool to be super creative. Um, this panda over here, you know, they're able to create and draw their own characters. So we've been learning about animals now, um, you know, draw that animal and, you know, show their habitat or um, how they find food or, or something like that. Um, adding text and dialogue. So um, you can add, you know, the captions or the letters across the top. You can add those talking bubbles and then the audio elements to be able to then um, use that microphone to share um, either things that your characters are saying or facts that you learned. Um, I think all of those are such fantastic tools just embedded within the app. I just sort of showed you how to share via Seesaw. Um, and again, just kind of that screen record works pretty well. And you can also screen record from a Chromebook. So it would work from there as well. Um, sometimes if I'm really struggling, you know, I might just have my phone in my hand and I'll just open up Seesaw in my, you know, teacher app and just hold up my phone and record, have them play it and record it that way. And then just upload it to Seesaw. So um, kind of a simplified way of doing that. Um, but really wanting to, you know, share those out in some way. There's a link to a Seesaw activity there if you do want to go into more depth. Um, I used this one when I was teaching remote first grade. Um, and so since we weren't in the room together, I, I did want to see a little bit more of their planning and reflection. So I used um, that planning page that's in um, the PBS Kids resources and then had them um, kind of work through and um, share about their planning. They could do it with voice or they could do it with text, um, but share their plan. Um, they, then they shared their screen recording of their project and then a project reflection. And if that's something you want to look at, there is a teacher link to that activity so you can kind of see what that activity looked like. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, so Tracy, you said that you've used this with kindergarten before. Um, I teach kindergarten, but I noticed that like, obviously when they first come in, they don't have a lot of computer skills at all. So have you used it more like later in the year or earlier? Or what was your experience with that? Um, I didn't do it. I mean, it was definitely not the first thing that I showed them. Um, we actually usually start with Seesaw. Um, and I, I'm trying to think of, I went into my sister teaches kindergarten and I went into her class. It was probably October or November though. Um, but I, what I loved about it is um, I could tell her kids had been using um, Seesaw and some other apps a lot because then they would recognize like, oh, I know when I'm done, I click that green check mark because um, that means that I'm done. And so I love how a lot of these tools use really similar icons for certain things because um, even if students have never used this before, um, they kind of know like, oh, the plus sign means I'm gonna be adding some things and the check mark means I'm gonna do this. And so they do start kind of, um, I guess, developing that digital vocabulary or whatever, sort of using those icons. Um, so it's not the first thing that I showed them, but I did, you know, it was in the fall that we started using this in several classrooms. And again, 
following that scaffolded, especially kindergarten, I really like following that PBS Kids um, scaffolded lesson um, because I like how it just sort of gives them a little bit at a time to let them get um, comfortable, but they, they did pretty amazing. I, one of the first classes I did it in was a couple teachers who are very reluctant technology users and they couldn't say enough. They were just like, oh my gosh, this was amazing. This was our favorite thing. Um, and it's the thing that the kids kept asking to do I, because they loved, I think they loved the creativity and they loved that animation. Like now I get to make it move. Like they thought that was so cool. And did you start it in like small group or whole group? Um, I usually every app that I do, I introduce whole group um, by projecting, you know, it, some way to project your um, iPad so that everybody can see it really well. Um, but typically I introduce every app whole group um, so that we can kind of learn it together. And then if they need to practice it a little bit more, I'll maybe pull a few back in a small group. Um, but I like introducing whole group at least one or two times, just so that we're kind of all doing it and exploring and problem solving together. Um, and then typically moving it into a center or um, like a choice of some sort, like, okay, you know, you've done all of your must use, now here's a, a can do or whatever. Um, I think anchor charts are really helpful too. Um, like, printing, I always print like screenshot and print. Um, I think this one has some really nice printables on the website. So yeah, the icons. You know, print them, yeah, those icons and then just have like a little chart up, like remember, click the plus sign, then click this and really like leave those visuals up. I think that can be really helpful for them too. Definitely. I'll okay. show this too. This is like okay. my dog ate the side of it, but um, this is a game that you can play with the kids to teach them about the flags and it's called Scratch Junior Simon Says. So it's just like when you're playing the app, you always have to start on the green flag. The green flag is like saying Simon Says. So we play this game and I think they introduced this in lesson two or three and you can print these off. I actually do it right off the top and it's like, okay, green flag. And then what would your body do for this one? And how many times would you do it? And then you'd get to this one and be like, oh, do you do anything here? And it's a really good, once they play this game, they never forget to put the green flag. <laughs> it's really oh, I like cool. that. And it's fun talking about what the different blocks do and what will the character do, um, especially like ones like this. Like, what do you think will happen when this one comes? And so we have a lot of, a lot of guessing games. They do go a little nutty during this part. So you have to set a timer and be like, okay, and we're gonna put that away now. Um, but I've also had teachers use these to, to signal transitions during different parts of the day too, um, to just have those symbols become a part of their classroom routine as well. Is that like a PDF that you could do like on the board yeah. digitally so we don't have to print pictures? Yeah. Yeah, it's a PDF, so you could do that too. I'd even like screenshot them and put them on Google Slides and then you could mix them up and yeah. through them that way too. But this is like the low tech unplugged version. I had to think about printing in color, which I was thinking about with those pig and cat um, lesson plans that you were saying like to send into the hall. Mm -hmm. I like that idea, but do they come in like a black and white version? No, but if you go to, when you're at your printer settings, you can print in grayscale. Um, okay. And then it won't worry, you won't have to worry about the color. Um, oh, I've got a question. Karen wants to know, they use the computer. Can we download the app on a computer? I don't think this works on, um, it only so, works on mobile devices. Apparently, um, my friend was just at a Scratch Junior learning something, I don't know. But they do have a beta version um, which means it's not quite ready, but they're working on it. A beta, like web version, okay. um, Scratch Junior. So right now, regular Scratch, if any of you are um, familiar with just regular old Scratch, um, I think it's scratch.org, um, is web-based. And um, I don't know what grade level is, probably third and up, 
um, fourth and up for regular Scratch um, and it's web-based. And then the Scratch Juniors are both apps. Um, so she did say that Scratch Junior, they're working on a web-based version. I don't know if that would be true for the PBS Kids. Um, Scratch Junior are just regular, but yeah, right now it's just an app. So mobile devices, it does go onto Chromebooks if you can get to the, thanks Nikki, um, if you can get to the um, Google Play Store from your Chromebook. Sometimes Chromebooks are too old and sometimes our tech departments have <laughs> shut that down. So um, if you can get to the Google Play Store, you can download the, the app onto your Chromebook and use it that way. And I don't think we said, you don't need Wi-Fi to use this either. Once the app's downloaded, these things don't need Wi-Fi um, to use and operate, which is really nice if you don't have stable Wi-Fi connections. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So the flag is kind of hiding. When I first add <laughs> something, um, like I'm gonna go here just to, it goes directly to sort of the blue blocks. And I wish, see, I have my little wish list of things I want it to do. Um, I wish it started on the yellow blocks because it's easy to miss. Um, but I always want to click on the yellow block and then I can pull that um, flag down. And then I can add whatever blocks after that that I want. And the point of the flag is um, then everything would start at the same time when I click on the flag. Um, so if I don't want them to start on the, at the same time, that's sort of what those other options are. Um, this one means it'll start when I touch it. So if I didn't want them to start both at the same time, maybe I would have... Um, you know, he's going to start when I touch him and she's going to start when I touch her. So I'm going to reset it and then they would both kind of move at a different time because they'll start on that touch. Um, and then the other things here are, these are, I guess this is one, I haven't quite figured this one out. It's like they have to bump each other, but I haven't quite... <laughs> figured that one out yet yeah then, when one character bumps into another and so where I've seen that used is if you set it up in kind of a space thing and so you can have like oh. asteroids bumping into one another and things happening as a result of that um Carrie used that one to make essentially a video game um that when the kids tapped things and moved it around um it would that one one thing bumped into another something happened a little bit more complex you know yeah that's cool mm -hmm. and then we started using um i haven't used these with kindergarten but first and second like so let's say after peg gets down this one starts getting a little bit more complex so after peg gets down she's gonna i'm gonna have her send a message and then cat is gonna start when he gets the message so I'm going to reset it. So she'll go first and then he'll go after it. So kind of a way of same with the bumping, I guess, of making them not all start at the same time. So we usually start on the flag just to sort of simplify it. I see a lot of people when I look at examples, a lot of people use this one, which is easy, but <laughs> I just forget to like touch. I forget to touch the character and trigger them because it you know, requires you to just kind of sit there and then tap them when you want it to go. Um, so I usually start just teaching them the flag, um, kind of like Nikki, just like use the flag, use the flag. And then when we start getting into those more complex projects where maybe they don't want everything to start at the same time, then kind of start showing them these other triggers. But I do think it's important um, to make sure that they always have, you know, something that they're starting it with. And so really just kind of training them to click on that yellow button and find that trigger first before they start um, into the code. Just so that to kind of show you the interface really is um, the same. Just what they have access to, the backgrounds that they have access to and characters are just different because they're not going to be the PBS characters. Oh, one other thing I'll show really quick because this took me a while to figure out. Um, the camera tool. So let's say I wanted to add my face to one of these characters. I'm going to tap on it and tap 
the um, paintbrush. So any character or background, I can tap on it and tap the paintbrush to change the colors or add detail to it. Um, the camera, I tap on it and then I have to tap where I want the picture to go. So that's the part I think I would always tap the camera and then be like, where's the camera? So once I tap the camera, if I want my face to go in there, I need to tap where I want it to go. And then <laughs> this is always fun. You get your face to fit in there and that's how the camera works. Um, and then again, using that paint bucket tool, you can um, go through and change, whoa, I need a tan. That's why I got to go to the pool after this so I can get a tan. <laughs> um, but I can use the paint bucket tool and then like change other details on there. Or I could use the drawing tool and I could add different details. So you can really customize those characters. But just so you kind of see how that um, camera tool works, you can use it um, in any of those um, when you have that paint bucket tool, but you always have to have something like maybe a shape or something, and then you have to tap where you want that picture to go. Um, you could use it in your backgrounds if you want it to be like a real photo of something. Um, you could use it in the background, and then when you open the background, then you just tap, you know, open that camera and tap, and then take a, a picture. But that was one that took me a, a minute to figure out. <laughs> that one is one that like look out once they figure out how to do that, they are. Yes. I dropped this link into the chat. I've never attended. I did it again, you guys. It's like I nervously tapped the screen and then it go, makes the slides go. Um, I just signed up for this conference. It's the Scratch Conference and it's free. Um, it's on July 21st, 9 to 4, and that's Eastern time. And I dropped the um, registration button into the um, chat. So if this is something you want to learn more about, or if Scratch itself is something you want to learn more about, um, this might be worth checking out. Like I said, I've never attended before, but I did sign up um, just to, to learn a little bit more this year. So I'm really looking forward to this. Um, so if that's something that you um Think might be of interest, um, please use that link and go ahead and get signed up for free. Okay, so next week, I hope you'll join us for Media Lab because we will have um, Sarah Rainey here and she's going to do Canva for education. Um, and there's all sorts of amazing things you can do with that one. Then we'll have a break on the 25th because I have to go out of town. And then our final media lab will be August 1st and Tracy will be back. And we're gonna do book creator and write reader for the final one. So you've got two more media labs coming up. Mm -hmm.